I'm so happy you've joined us tonight for Dimensions of Prophecy. I'm Brenda Wood. The Bible speaks about a thousand years of peace in Revelation, the 20th chapter. Kenneth Cox is going to be studying that chapter tonight during his presentation entitled, The Prophetic 1,000 Years of Peace. You'll learn from God's Word when the 1,000 years starts, what will take place at the beginning of this period, what will happen during the 1,000 years, and just how it will close. You'll want to know. I assure you tonight's presentation will help you get an overall picture of what's going to happen during the time known by many as the millennium. Let's go immediately to the crusade now and join Pastor Cox and his team for tonight's presentation, The Prophetic 1,000 Years of Peace. Thank you, Steve. Amen. That warms my soul. Music has a great, great effect on all of us. I don't know about you, but music just picks us up and lifts me towards heaven, and I greatly appreciate it. There was an old man who had decided he had had it with civilization, thought that mankind was going to the dogs, decided that he wanted to move out into the woods, forget about everybody and everything, sell all of his possessions, and just eke out an existence off the land. So he sold everything he had, put what he thought he needed in a backpack, and started hiking into the woods. Went as far back as he could go until there wasn't a soul of anybody around, nobody. Built him a little hut, began to make a living off the land, didn't have a radio, no newspaper, nothing. No contact with the outside of the world at all. And after a couple years, I guess, his curiosity got the best of him. Thought maybe mankind had killed himself off, and so he decided to come out and take a look, see if everybody was still around put a few things in his backpack and headed down the path, and after walking for a day and a half, he came upon a road. And just as he stepped out on the road, he noticed down the road came a battalion of soldiers marching. Stood there and watched them as they marched down the road. And pretty soon a sergeant came by with his platoon. And he hollered out to the sergeant, said, Sergeant, where are you going? And the sergeant said, to war. And the old hermit stood there a little bit. He shouted back to the sergeant. He said, Sergeant, where are you coming from? And the sergeant said, from peace. And the old hermit said, why are you going to war? And the sergeant said, so we can have peace. And the old man shook his head and walked back into the woods. You see, there's a lot of people that are looking for peace. Almost every statesman, president, one after another have said, after this we won't have war anymore. In fact, I have in my files at home, newspaper. Headline says, President Nixon says this is our last war. War to end all wars. They just said, when this war's over, there's not going to be war anymore. In fact, when we came to the end of the First World War, they established the League of Nations. They said, now we won't have war. But it wasn't too long until we were in the Second World War, and when we came into that, we established the United Nations, and we said, now we'll sit down at the conference table, and we'll hash it all out, and we won't have war anymore. But we've had one war right after another. But the Bible speaks about a thousand years of peace. And mankind is looking for that time in which there will be an utopia, a millennium of peace in which there won't be war anymore. This thousand years of peace is spoken of over in Revelation, the 20th chapter. We're going to take a look and see what it has to say about it. Revelation, 
the 20th chapter, starting with verse 1, it says, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So it describes this angel coming from heaven. He has a great chain in his hand, and it goes on and says, And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So it says that he took the devil and bound him a thousand years. Now it continues on. And he cast him into a bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. And after these things, he must be released for a little season. So it says that the devil is shut up, he's bound, he's chained for a thousand years. Now, what we want to find out tonight is we want to find out when does this thousand years start? When's it going to start? What begins the thousand years? What's going to go on during this thousand years? And what's going to bring the thousand years to a close? That's what we want to find out tonight. Let's see if we can begin to get an idea when the thousand years starts. Revelation 20, verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the what? First resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. So it says that this thousand years is going to begin with the resurrection of the righteous. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. All right, let's see what it says about it because it says those that have part in the first resurrection. Now, who is in that first resurrection? Well, listen to what the Scripture says about it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So it says all the people that have died in the Lord Jesus Christ, it says that all those people are going to come out of the grave first and they're going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. All right, so we have all the righteous being resurrected here. Let's follow the scripture farther. Revelation 20, verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Now, if we resurrected all the righteous here in the first resurrection, and it says the rest of the dead didn't live again until the end of the thousand years, then who does that have to be? It has to be the wicked. So what you have is you have 1,000 years between two resurrections. This is the resurrection of the righteous, and this is the resurrection of the wicked. They are separated by 1,000 years, and as you read the Scripture, if you bear that in mind, a lot of it will begin to make sense. Listen to what it says here in John. John 5, verse 28 says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice. You were here last night. We talked about that. All that are in their graves will hear his voice. Now listen carefully. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And then it says, and those who have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. That's the second resurrection. Those two resurrections are separated by 1,000 years. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to see what events begin this 1,000 years because there's certain events that take place. We've listed them for you, and it's, we're going to find that Jesus is going to come. We're going to find that the righteous are going to be resurrected. The righteous living are going to be translated. The wicked will be destroyed and Satan will be bound. These are the events that are going to begin this thousand years. To begin with, the Scripture says that Jesus is going to come. We read about it here in John, the 14th chapter in verse 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what? I will come again 
and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So the scripture says that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to gather all of his people, take them to heaven with him where they will live and reign with him 1,000 years. Now let's take it a step farther. So Jesus comes with the coming of Jesus. Then we find all the righteous, all the righteous that have died down through time since Adam, all those people are going to be resurrected. Jesus is going to come with a shout. Listen, for the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus is going to come. He's going to shout. His voice is going to roll through this earth like peals of the loudest thunder, and the dead that are in the grave will hear his voice. And they will come forth. In fact, it describes it here in Corinthians. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all, what? Sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twink of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So all the righteous that have died since the beginning of time are all going to be resurrected out of their graves, going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. Now, what about the righteous living that are here on the earth? What's going to happen to them? Well, we find that the Bible teaches that they're going to be translated. That's what it says. Let's go back and read this 16th verse of 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Now, notice verse 17 because it continues on. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's the righteous that have been resurrected. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So it says all the righteous that have been resurrected, all the righteous that are living, all of them are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So we find here at the beginning all the righteous are taken to heaven. The wicked, the wicked dead. The Bible says what about them? Huh? Oh, it says that they lived not again until the thousand years was finished. So when Jesus comes here and he shouts and his voice rolls through this earth, the wicked don't hear that. They're not disturbed. They just stay right there in their grave. What about the wicked that are living? The wicked that are alive at the time Jesus comes. Well, it says this about them. It says that they will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Listen. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the what? The brightness of his coming. It says that God is as a consuming fire to the wicked. You understand the difference between the righteous and the wicked? Huh? Do you? Do you know what the Scripture calls the righteous? Huh? He calls them gold. He uses the word gold for the righteous, and fire does what to gold? It refines it but he refers to the wicked as stubble. And fire does what the stubble? Okay, completely different. And it says that the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. He continues to describe it. Revelation 6, verse 14, it says, The sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand? You know, I run on some people that tell me that when Jesus comes that... Uh, Nobody's going to know it. The righteous, you know, are just going to be kind of whisked out of here, and the wicked are going around saying, where did everybody go? 
uh, I can't read that in the Scripture. You mean to tell me when the heavens split and they roll back like a scroll and the mountains start moving and islands disappear, people won't know something's going on? You better believe they know something's going on. Not quiet. It's not something people don't know. They will know it, and they'll cry for the rocks and the mountains. Fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and it says that they will be destroyed. Listen as the Scripture continues to describe it. In Revelation, Revelation 19, verse 11, it describes the coming of the Lord, and it says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and with righteousness he judges and makes war. Now listen carefully. His eyes were like the flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. This is referring to the angels, and it says that they're going to come with the Lord. In fact, the Scripture says that all the angels will come with Jesus Christ. And listen to what one of these angels does. It talks about one of these angels that is standing in the sun. And he cries to the fowls, to the birds of the heaven, and he tells them to come and gather together for the supper of the great God. The wicked are slain by the brightness of Christ's coming. They fall right there and they become food for the birds because this is what it says in the next verse. That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sat on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So it says that the wicked fall to the ground and it says they become the food of birds. All right. Now we've talked about the righteous being taken to heaven. The wicked dead are not disturbed. The wicked living are destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. So the scripture says that Lucifer, the devil, Satan, is bound. And he cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. After these things he must be released for a little while. Well, it says the devil's bound. Now, let me ask you something. If all the righteous are up in heaven and all the wicked are dead, who does he have to tempt? Nobody. That's what it means when it says he's chained, he's bound. Doesn't mean a physical chain. A physical chain's not going to hold the devil. I can read to you over in the Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter, where it talks about Jesus going over the shores of the Gadarenes and it talks about those two men come running out of the tombs and it said they had been bound with chains and had broken them asunder. If chains won't hold men, they certainly won't hold the devil. So what's it talking about? Well, haven't you ever had somebody come over to your house and say, oh, uh, how about going to town with me? And you said, oh, I'd like to, but I'm just tied down. What did you mean? Well, you meant circumstances wouldn't let you go. That's what you meant. And the same thing's true here. It's bound by circumstances. So we find that this is what takes place during that thousand years. The devil is bound for a thousand years. God gives him a thousand years to think over all the crime and the degradation and all the sin. That's part of his punishment. That's what God gives him that thousand years to think that over. During this thousand years, we find that the earth, we find that this earth is going to be in a chaotic state. I run on some people that want to talk about the earth being inhabited during this thousand years and all that. No. The righteous are in heaven, the wicked are dead, and the only one that's here is the devil and his angels. Jeremiah 25, verse 33, describes the condition of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be in that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be refuse upon the ground. It says the wicked are going to fall. They're going to lay right there. They won't be gathered. They won't be lamented. They won't be buried. Jeremiah continues to describe it. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void in the heavens, and they had no light. You ever read that text some other place? Huh? 
You ever read that some other place in Scripture? Where? In Genesis. When it talks about the earth being without form and void in Genesis, and it talks about it here in Jeremiah, it means the earth is in a chaotic state, and that's why in the book of Revelation it refers to it as the bottomless pit. It says the devil was thrown into the bottomless pit. It means this earth in the chaotic condition that it's in. Now, this is not talking about creation here in Jeremiah. Don't mix that up because the Scripture makes that perfectly clear. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Now, you're going to have to, you know, put on your thinking cap, and you've got to stay with me here. You've got to think, all right? The next verse says, I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. Did you understand that verse? Did you let that one slip by you? Huh? That verse says that supper is over. You catching it? That angel stood in the sun and said, Come to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of captains and a slave and a free, and the birds have eaten them, and there's no man, and the birds have fled. That's what it's saying. Supper's over. All right, now to show you, this is not talking about creation. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities, all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. You see, this is describing the earth during the thousand years. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Please. Remember that text for tomorrow night. Remember that text for tomorrow night. It's extremely important. The whole land shall be desolate, yet I'll not make a full end. So the land during this thousand years is going to be in a chaotic condition. There won't be anybody here but the devil and his angels. Okay, what are the righteous going to be doing during this thousand years? Well, if we go to Revelation, the 20th chapter, in verse 4, it tells us what the righteous are going to be doing during this period of time. It says, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. It says that he saw these people that were Christ, and what had been given to them? Huh? Judgment. It said, I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and what? Judgment was given to them. Let's see who it's talking about who had not worshipped the beast or his image or had not received his mark on their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it's talking about these people, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrections, for they will live and reign with Christ a thousand years. In other words, it's talking about the righteous. And I run on some of these people and say, you don't have to worry about the beast. You don't have to worry about the mark. You don't have to know who that is. Dear friend, let me tell you something. If you're planning on being up there, you better know about it. This idea of telling people, oh, you can shut your eyes and stick your head in the sand and you don't need to know, you better stop listening to that kind of stuff. You better know who the beast is and you better know what the mark is and you better know what the number is. And we'll be talking about it before too long, so we hope that you're here when we talk about it. But it says that the righteous judgment was given to them. Why is God going to give judgment to the righteous? And who are they going to judge? Well, let's see. The Scripture tells us. Do you not know that the saints will judge the what? The world. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more the things that pertain to this life? Now, why is God going to give judgment to them? Well, let me ask you something. Some people have an idea, you know, that when you get up to heaven, the Lord's going to reach back here and he's going to turn something and everybody's going to become stooges. They think that everybody's going to go through eternity, eternity saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I don't believe that. See, we use about 10% of our mind at the present time. I believe when we get there, we'll use all of it, 100%. So let's say you get up there and you look around and here's someone you knew that's not there. 
and you thought they were a good person, you thought that they followed the Lord, and they're not there, what are you going to do? You're going to go through eternity saying, wonder where John is. Wonder why John's not here. Oh, I better just keep my mouth shut. Strange that John's not here. Wonder why. Oh, I better not say anything about it. You think you're going to go through eternity like that? Do you think God's going to get 10,000 years into eternity and have somebody yell, hey, wait a minute? No. God's going to open the books, and dear friends, they're going to go through the books, and they're going to see that the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, did everything they could to save every last soul. And let me tell you something. If you don't make it, it won't be God's fault. God's trying to get you into heaven. He's not trying to keep you out. He wants you saved. In fact, he bent over backwards to see that you get there. He's doing everything that he can to save every last person. And they're going to go through the records and they're going to see that God did everything that he could. It'll satisfy them in their minds that God did all that he could to save every last individual. Okay. Even the angels that were lost. That's why it says we shall judge angels. We come to the end. The end of the thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. It says here at the end of the thousand years, all the wicked are going to be resurrected. Oh, let me tell you, there is a great difference between this resurrection and that resurrection. You see, in this resurrection, it says we're changed in a moment in the twink of an eye. Those people that here that were blind that follow the Lord, they come out of that grave seeing. If they were deaf, they came out hearing. If they didn't have a leg, they came out with both of them. Not down here. No change here. The wicked come out of the grave like they went in it. No change. The rest of the dead, Live not again until the thousand years were finished. Now, there are certain things that mark the end of this thousand years. The wicked are going to be raised. Satan's going to be loosed. The new Jerusalem's going to come back to earth. The wicked are going to be destroyed, and the earth's going to be made new. Those are the things that are going to take place, and we're going to look at them very, very quickly. All the wicked are going to be resurrected from their grave and as they're resurrected from their grave, it says here, and when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Naturally. All of a sudden here are people. He's got people to work with. And don't get the idea that during this thousand years that he's here on earth, that he spent that whole thousand years twiddling his thumbs. I mean, he's got something in mind. Don't think he doesn't. So he's released out of his prison. It says in Revelation 21, verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It says that this new Jerusalem that Jesus has made with his own hands, it says it, becomes, it comes down to this earth, and it says that the righteous are coming with it coming back to this earth. In the book of Zechariah, it tells you exactly where it's coming to. Listen. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. If you've ever been over there, that's exactly where it is. You can walk up on the Mount of Olives and look right across the Valley of Jehoshaphat, up the Mount of Moriah, and right there is where Jerusalem is, the Temple Mountain all. It's on the east. Okay. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall, remove, shall move towards the north and half of it towards the south. So it says that Jesus' feet is going to touch the Mount of Olives, and as his feet touch the Mount of Olives, it's going to split right down the middle, and it's going to divide, and it's going to become a huge plain. It has to be big. Because the New Jerusalem is 375 miles on a side. Then you shall flee through the mountain valleys 
for the mountain valley shall reach unto Azel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with thee. So it says it's going to become a huge plain. The new Jerusalem is going to come and rest right there. All right? Now something begins to happen. Speaking of the devil, Lucifer, and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number is as the sands of the sea. It says the wicked are just like the sands of the sea. And it says the devil goes out and gathers all them to battle. And like I said, during this thousand years, don't think he's not preparing for war. He is. He's built all kinds of things, and so he gathers the wicked, and this is what happens. And they came up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. They go up and they surround the new Jerusalem that's come down from out of heaven and is settled there where the Mount of Olives was, and it says the wicked go up and surround it. Why? Why don't they just leave it alone? Why don't they go over some other place on the earth and say, We'll live over here and we'll let the righteous live over there and we'll just leave them alone. Why go up and try to take it? Because there's something involved here. Watch carefully. You remember? In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree there called the Tree of Life. Listen to what the Scripture says about it. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and what? Live forever. Okay. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubims at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Do you know where the tree of life is now? It is in the New Jerusalem. And in the middle of the street on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, yielded its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and that tree of life's inside the new Jerusalem, and the devil tells the wicked if they can storm the city and get in and eat of that tree, they'll live, they'll not die. And so they go up. They surround the city, prepare to take it. It's at this point that the great white throne judgment happens when all of a sudden God is lifted up above that city. And there before all mankind passes in panoramic view the whole plan of salvation. And the scripture says that every knee bows and says, Thou art just, O God. The righteous are inside the city. The wicked are on the outside. And then this is what happens. The wicked get up off their knees and try to take the city. They came up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. Fire came down from God out of heaven, devoured. It says that God rained down fire out of heaven. It burns this whole earth. In fact, that new Jerusalem is going to ride those flames just like the ark rode the flood. The righteous will be in it take care of his people. And this is how Peter describes it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The element will melt. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God because of which the heaven being on fire will be dissolved and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Oh, it says that the Lord's going to burn this earth. And after he's burned it, then it says he's going to make it new. And it's going to become the home of God's people. So this thousand years that the Bible talks about, 
This thousand years is divide, divides, or the thousand years divides two resurrections. Jesus is going to come. The righteous are going to be resurrected. The righteous living are going to be translated. The wicked are going to be destroyed. And the devil is going to be bound. During this thousand years, the earth's going to be desolate in a chaotic state. The devil and his angels will be here. The righteous will be up in heaven. And at the end of the thousand years, it says that the wicked will be raised. We find that the devil's going to be released out of his prison. The new Jerusalem is going to come back from heaven, come from heaven, I should say. And then we find that the wicked will all be destroyed and the earth's going to make this, the Lord's going to make this earth completely new. That's what's going to happen. That's simply what it's talking about when it talks about this thousand years. You see, it says that God's going to prepare a special place for his people. He's going to burn the earth, and then he's going to make it completely new, special place for his people. As a boy, the first few years of my life was spent in Chicago, Illinois. My parents told me of a situation that happened there. There was a young newspaper reporter that had come to Chicago to work on a story. Evidently, he had put in a hard day, and he checked into a hotel down on the Loop, if you know what the Loop is. That's down by Lake Michigan, Loop Drive there. Checked into a room on the ninth floor, and being tired, went to bed. About 3 o'clock in the morning, he was jarred out of his sleep by the sound of a siren. Jumped out of bed, ran to the window, and found out that the hotel he was in was on fire. He grabbed the phone and by some chance was able to get his editor. He told the editor, the hotel I'm in is on fire. And he said, I'm going to give you a moment-by-moment -moment account of what it's like to be in a hotel that's on fire. And that editor said, you forget it. You get out of there, you get out of there now. And the young reporter said, no. He said, I have my escape all planned. I'm okay. And he began to describe how the fire had broken out on the second floor and how he could hear the siren of the fire trucks as they were coming to the fire. And he described how the smoke was making its way up the elevator shafts and the laundry chutes and the stairway. And he talked about how the people were running down the hall screaming and yelling help for help and how that they literally piled up at the stairways and the elevator shafts and trampled one another underfoot. He described how the smoke made its way down the hallways and how it would go into the rooms and how people were coughing, suffocating from the smoke. He described how the heat was rising and as the heat rose, it sucked the oxygen out of the air and you had to bend over just to be able to breathe. Described all the horrors of being in a hotel that was on fire. Finally, the phone line was gone. And the young newspaper reporter went over to the window to crawl out on the fire escape to make his way down, only to find the fire escape now is red hot. And he shouted to the firemen below to stretch out their nets that he was going to jump. And they stretched out their nets. And the young newspaper reporter jumped but missed the net, fell to his death. You know, I find a lot of people today that are hanging on, thinking at the very last moment they're going to jump. Oh, dear friend, let me tell you something. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. It says there are going to be people who are going to say, oh, the summer has ended, the harvest has passed, and we're not saved. Tonight, at this very moment, the door of mercy is open. You can reach out. You can accept Jesus Christ. You can have eternal life tonight, right now, not some other time. 
But right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to you. Right now, you can open your heart and accept him. I want you to listen carefully as Steve sings right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much that right now, each one of us can reach out in faith. We can accept Thee, that we can have life eternal, that we can be among those that will look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for Him. He'll save us. May this be the experience of each one. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen.